1953, Roger Raymondon published an hundred Greek documents from Henri Haines excavations carried on at Edfou in 1921-1922. These documents, known as P. Apol, constitute the archive of Papas, Pagat of Edfou. <coughs> they had been preserved in a jar, during, and during the transportation of this jar from Edfou to Cairo, the papyri were, were all reduced to pieces. Under these conditions, the work of reconstruction and interpretation of the Greek text carried out by Raimondo arose admiration. This is the jar, still visible at the IFAO, and this is the way uh, one can imagine the papyri were, were, were put in the jar. And you will see how the papyri look like soon. The jar also contained Coptic papyri, on which Raimondo, without publishing any of them, bears the following judgment. As I have said above, there were also Coptic papyri in the jar. They are less numerous than the Greek ones and equally badly preserved. Reading them as thoroughly and attentively as possible has shown that they are usually private letters, often written by priests and monks. Whether they are Greek or Coptic, all the documents concern the same person named Papas, though that the jar did not contain the archive of one family but of one individual. This archive was assigned to the beginning of the 8th century by Raimondo, but this date was reviewed by Jean Gascou and Taz Roth in the <coughs> documentation Apollinopolite in 1982. They are, in fact, from the years 670, making it a very important material in the study of the administration of Egypt at that time. Then, in a 1988 article, Leslie McCool began to reconsider a number of Coptic papyri, questioning the idea that Coptic documents would be private and showing that they concern, in fact, the same official subject as the Greek documents. On the data provided both by the P. Apple and McCool article is based Cliff Cliff Force Enlightening Article, Egypt under Mohawia, Part 1, Flavius Papas and Upper Egypt. Since McCool's article, the public papyri have remained unpublished. As you can see, some of them are quite well preserved and uh, a lot of pieces are on the other side. On the other side. In the early 2000s, Geneviève Favrel, an independent French researcher, proceeded to reconstruct and transcribe many texts, but the scope of the task did not allow her to publish anything before her death. So in 2015, Alain Delattre and I decided to launch a collective project on the Coptic papyri of the archive. A team of about 10 people is now working more or less regularly on this text. Three members of the team, if I am not wrong, are among the speakers of our conference. We were able to meet twice for one week study at the IFAO in January 2016, and you can see here Isabel Marco working side by side with Jean Gascou, and April 2017. A third batch of documents will be published in the next IFAO. If we consider again Raimondon's remarks on the Coptic papyri, we can comment on them as follows. They are less numerous than the Greek ones. It is not true. They are probably more numerous. And equally badly preserved. This is true. <laughs> they are usually private letters often written by priests or monks. This is not true. All documents refer to the same character. This is probably true. So my presentation today aims to go a little further and to present some progress on completing the figure of Pepes, especially through the respective functions of Greek and Coptic papyri from the jar. First, there are, there are indeed some private documents. 
A reproach which may be addressed to the publication of the P. Apple is that it never mentions the presence of a Coptic text on the backside of a Greek document. There are, however, several cases, as evidenced by the work done over the last year and a half. Among them, P. Apple 74 will first retain our attention because it could be the basis of Raymondon's impression about the nature of the Coptic text. On the back of this Greek list of onomata, on the right side of the, of the slide, one of the longest Coptic texts is preserved, which is, which is all the more substantial since we have recently found another Greek fragment. <laughs> Not much better. Uh, the Coptic text is a rough, rough dra draft of an, arbit an arbitration report very interesting in many respects. The object of the dispute is the inheritance of a half cell or half chamber. A large number of people are called to testify, including Abdias and someone who is priest of probably the church of Perpe, Johannes, the deacon of the Holy Topos of Epiphanius, Sina, daughter and the priest who I, the are called to declare what they know under oath before the bishop, and a certain Marcos, described as Eulabus status, therefore, therefore probably ecclesiastical, is one of the parties because the deceased owner owed him some money. As for Papas, he is mentioned in a non placed fragment of the document with the title Theophile status. He might be one of the arbitrators of the dispute, which would fit well with his function as Prager. This text cannot have escaped Raymondron's attention, and it is probably partly basing on it that he judged the Coptic papyri as issued mainly by clerks and monks. This Coptic draft was obviously reused to write the Greek account. It just makes it possible to understand also why Raymondon characterized the Coptic document as private. This one is private indeed, but it is part of Papa's archive only by accident. To tell the truth, another text that Raymondon could not fail to use is the PIFAO Inventory 19, currently being published by Isabelle Marteau. It is the lower part of a letter, the content of which is not entirely clear, but which is clearly addressed by monks to a civil authority. Given the title Megalo Prepestatos, this authority is most likely the Pagar himself. The leaders of a monastery has asked for help, using a rhetoric that refers to the well-known Byzantine patterns of relationships between the <coughs> owners and the monasteries of which they were the benefactors. Papas, as a landowner, is likely to play his role. So be kind enough to make an effort to agree with them about the two akashes, so that God will bring you, will bring you our prayers and our blessings in abundance in exchange for the deeds you do for the holy monastery. The main thing is that I greet your filial greatness I pray to the measure of my humility that the Lord God will bring our prayers to you and all of yours and grant you a reward for the, for the deeds you do for the Holy Monastery in this place and in the next. Apart from, this, from, from these two texts, which can be regarded as private and show Papa's relationships with the religious institutions of his Pagarchi, as well as some other texts which also testify, testify to his role as a benefactor, very few texts concern priests and monks. But before going any further into the text, I would like to offer some reflections and questions about privacy. What exactly does the term private refer to? Obviously, the opposition is not between family life and professional life. All Papa's correspondence concerns his professional life, and we learn very little about the members of his family, both in Greek and Coptic. In addition, the use of the term brother 
in several types of relationships tends to confuse things. No Coptic document, to the best of our knowledge, mentions Papa's father, Liberios, who was Pagar of Edfu before his son, neither his wife Sarah nor his children. Actually, the, whole, the only Coptic document involving Liberios as a Pagar does not mention Papas. It is SB Copt 1242, published by Krum as Coptische Zünfte und das Pfeffer Monopol. It is an homologia addressed to Liberios, Pagar of Edfu, by various corporations attesting the reception of quantities of paper to be redistributed by each head of corporation within his corporation. As for Papa's brother Johannes, who is called Kuros Johannes in the Greek text, further investigation is needed. There are indeed several occurrences of the Kuros Johannes in the Coptic documents, but several different persons can bear this name and title. So the opposition is between the management of public affairs, which basically consists of receiving the various orders of taxation and requisitions and dividing them among its, citi its citizens, and the management of Papa's affairs as a landowner and local worthy man. In this category are lease or loan contracts, for example, income or expenditure <coughs> accounts, these texts are frequent among the Greek, Greek texts, but virtually non-existent among the Coptic texts. Or it can be arbitration of local conflicts. We saw P. Apple, um, just of P. Apple 74, and there is also P. Apple 61, a Greek letter from Liberius to Papas, exhorting him to reconcile the mother and his son. However, the dividing line between both categories is not always clear. As will be seen below, the fiscal pressure of the Arab administration had repercussions on the daily life of Papa's citizens and people. As a beggar, Papa was responsible on the one hand for the organization of the payment of taxes, requisitions, and so on. On the other hand, vis-a-vis -vis the population, in an attempt to maintain equity and supporting the weakest. From this intermediate and uncomfortable position, the Coptic documents make particularly good accounts. The second reflection is about the status of the deacon. Uh, and this is to emphasize the fact that deacons are often mentioned as intermediaries in public affairs and without link with the church. This is the case, for instance, in P. Apple 10 and 37, and in several Coptic papyri. This title should not, therefore, lead to hasty conclusions about the nature of the text. And the third remark is about the importance of paleography. The two so-called private documents we saw before, P. Apple 75, 74, and 90, are written in a bilinear majuscule typical of private documents. On the other hand, a large number of other documents, Coptic documents, are written in professional cursive and writings close to those of the Greek documents. And in addition, the addresses are often in Greek. Let us now consider different types of Coptic documents related with official affairs. And I am going to distinguish three levels. The first level concerns orders from above. Even at the highest level, that is to say in the orders transmitted by officials of the Arab administration, Coptic seems sometimes to be used, which is not expected. This example is inventory 205, analyzed by Matt Poole in, the, in an article and revised and in the process of being published by Lajos Verkes. The final greeting, Tirene Nak, Peace Up a New, suggests that this document comes from the office of an official of the Arab administration. This is a letter about requisition of equipment for the fleet. Such a document was probably not unique as this final salutation has been identified in two or three other Coptic fragments. 
As noted by Laios Berkes, and according to a recent article by Federico Morelli, the word Amir, Coptic Amira or Amera, the Greek Amira, is not equivalent of the Duke of Tibai, as suggested by Raimondo, but corresponds to an Arab title of commander at first military, whose function and place in the hierarchy remains rather vague. Second level, between people of the same rank. A large number of documents <coughs> greetings from greeting formulas or addresses where Papas is designated by his most common title, titles, Peribleptos, Theophylactos, Megalopetestatos. These addresses are perfectly similar to those of Greek documents. Such letters seem to come either from the secretaries, notarium of the ducal office, or from colleagues of Papas, for instance, other pagans. As emphasized by force, such secretaries, notarium, are omnipresent in the archive. They belong to the same class, cl the same class as Papas. They therefore transmit orders, but address Papas with stereotype formulas showing that they are equals or colleagues. The Greek letters of the archive have, have preserved the name of several of them, Eladios, Theodoros, Elias, Polutos. Two examples can show the possible variations and nuances in the Coptic papyri. The first one is uh, Inventory 21 plus 34, to be published by Esther Garel, where the formulas and tone recall some Greek letters written to Papas by Elias, notary of the Topoteretes, who is the assistant of the Duke. And the text reads, here are the two lists I have sent to you brotherly illustriousness, those for which the deacon Severus has touched, and so on and so on. Another example is inventory uh, 11 to be published by Jegorz Oshawa. Before all things, I greet your illustrious Penibleptos, Lord and Brother. For indeed, it has been a long time since we were not mostly of receiving your precious letter. When the glorious brother Mata needed a small amount of wool black and col in color, of black wool in black and colored wool probably, I met our brother <coughs> the Lord Saleh. He went to the south and I annulled his affair. I requested him and I sent him to you so that you come together with him and so that he take them and bring them to me and so on and so on. The letter is obviously addressed to Papas. The sender is at least an equal of Papas. The individual named Mata on line 6 bears, bears the title of Endoxotes, which seems reserved in this archive to the Topoteretes or to the Cartularios of the Pagan. It could be an Arab and apparently someone of importance, since the sender sends a man on purpose namely the Lord Saleh, after cancelling his previous task in order to procure matter a little wood. In this occasion, Papas and his correspondent probably have to collaborate and satisfy the wish coming from above as soon as possible. The third level, I would call it complaints and requests from below, is illustrated on the screen. This kind of letters are often characterized by, by more polite and respectful forms of politeness and long complaints, partly rhetorical, but in which one can perceive all the same the distress caused by the weight of the requisition. A nice example is inventory 25, addressed to Papas by someone who had to execute a requisition, probably, at the local level, and struggled to do it. The use of Coptic here mm. is perfectly expected. Uh, I, am, I think I don't need to read the translation, but everybody can, can read it. And um, a part of the 
a rhetorical side and or, or the very bad situation of the man, uh, particularly interesting here is the use of the term antidox, for which we have another attestation in the Coptic text of the archive, and I know of another occurrence outside the archive in P. Gets 25, a document related to the monastery of St. Jeremiah in Saqqara. In his recent article of the Festschrift Bastianini, Federico Morelli points out that the dux is nearly absent of the P. Apple, with the exception of P. Apple 9. The Tocoteretes, his assistant, seems to be the person with whom the Amir lies much more than the dux. Is it possible to hypothesis, hypothesize a temporary vacan vacancy or interim period during which the Topotoretes was acting? Since the word Topotoretes is not attested in the Coptic documents until now, is the Coptic antidux the equivalent of the Topotoretes? All these questions cannot yet be answered. It seems, for instance, that the word dux appears at least in three Coptic documents. So things are probably more complicated. So all what I have said could be summarized in this rough table uh, called Papa's Network. Uh, I think that James saw it was already in Chicago, but <laughs> it, changed, it changed a little because I, I, I had to, to distinguish the Duke and the Amir. And as I hope to have shown, the Coptic text obviously completes the figure of Papas as a member of a bilingual Christian elite, but not in a simple division between public and private. The Greek and Coptic texts work in complementarity in the official sphere. The modalities of this complementarity remain to be defined, and this will be one of the tasks of the team working on this archive. Thank you very much.